Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as usual, is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. Hello, Rob. Hello, Stephen. And uh, today, uh, today, I tell you, this is going to be the hardcore techie. So for those of you listening and you don't want hard, hardcore techie, you might, you might get confused. But we got the whole Rack End team here. We have uh, Greg Althaus here, uh, you know, Shane Gibson here, and Victor Lothar. Hopefully I said it right, Victor. If I didn't, I apologize. Louther, everyone. Louther. So I think I did okay. So um, you know, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna focus a lot on the changes that have happened the last few months on uh, what's happened with the digital rebar project. And Rob, can you just give a quick two minute overview of digital rebar for listeners, and then we can start diving in. Digital rebar version three actually started as a bundle of services out of digital rebar version two, or. DHCP, Pixie Provision, HTTP, TFTP, things like that. And what we found when we, when we were doing version two is that there was a real need for very clean REST APIs. Um, so get, put, create, delete, and patch. And I, I want to spend some time talking about patch. Um, and a very strong CLI that you could use to call those. Because what we were doing with version two is we were really driving boot provision using a whole bunch of extra orchestration. That didn't make it into version three. We use other things for that. Um, but those REST APIs and the CLI that goes with it really became the, the essence of, of how you took all operations, all actions in, in the system. Right? Even, our, even our UX is really, it's, just, it's a React UX. It uses the REST APIs uh, exclusively. It's the only way things can happen in, in this version. So, so Greg, in, in this version, we, we ended up, right, really highlighting uh, the patch capabilities of the system. A, a lot of people don't even think about patch when they, when they deal with, with a REST API. They only think about the CRUD actions. You want to take a second and, and explain why we, we use patch and what, uh, start with what patch is. And then, and then well, actually, Victor's Victor's our, our patch king. Um, so, so Victor, what is patch as opposed to the other REST APIs that people are more familiar with, and why did we choose to use it? Um, pretty much as 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 in the tell us how we use it and why. Okay, so. Patch for us consists of two parts. Uh, first, it's just a, an HTTP verb called patch um, that indicates that instead of doing a whole object uh, create or replace, you intend to do a partial object replace. And the way we do that is we use the patch verb whenever we want to update amount, whenever we want to do a partial update of something. And whenever we use that verb, we always send a JSON patch structure um, that describes how to transform the uh, object that's on the server into what we into what the client wants it to be, and we include uh, the JSON patch uh, standard has uh, built-in support for using test stanzas to make sure that uh, nothing that we care about has changed on the server since we generated the patch, and we use those to make sure that we can do atomic updates of. Um, fields in the objects whenever we want to, uh, for instance, uh, you know, flip, a, flip a switch from on to off or generate a new uh, token for something or just to make sure that nothing has come in and uh, done something that uh, will mess up what that will, that has changed the state in a way that we can't handle. So there's actually a reference site called jasonpatch.com that, that explains how this works. Why not just use put? What's wrong with put? This is how people would normally do this, right? Put does a whole object uh, replacement. Basically, with uh, put, you always pull down the object you want, change it, and then push the new object back. Um, the problem with uh, that methodology in particular is that you have to uh, you have to go out of band to ensure that uh, when you put the new object, you aren't uh, blowing away changes that someone else made in the interim. Um, with patch, you have the capability of detecting that someone else has made changes by the test stanzas failing, and uh, then reporting that error back to uh, back to whichever API user lost the fight to change an object. And so that change surfaced for us in a big way in the three four one release. 
right? Which is I'm leading back to Greg at this point because it, it really enabled us to take advantage of this locking, sort of locking capability. You want to explain that? Yeah, so in 341, we made sure that the patch object was applicable across the whole set of systems, made sure the API handled it correctly, and then updated the CLI so that you could pass a reference object into the system. So, so up before 341, the system always did kind of what Victor described. It did a get, created a patch object, and then made sure that patch object matched. That was fine and, and made the operation that we were trying to do atomic within the single call and the CLI. But there's times where you want to be able to get the object, do some operations, maybe wait a while, and then put a result back. Um, in that case, you can't just let the CLI always get a new instance of the object because that would maybe invalidate all the previous work you've done. So what we did was we allowed the CLI to take reference objects. So there's a new parameter dash dash ref, which can take a file or a JSON blob that represents the object that you want to create the tests from. This way I can get an object, wait 15 minutes, and then do my update. And then if somebody had come in and modified that object in the meantime, catch it. So where do we use this? Or where are some examples of how we use this? So one is um, our Kubernetes Kube Admin installer uses it. We use it to install uh, and pick a master. So what happens is we need to choose one of the five nodes, for example, that we want to install Kubernetes on. So they all race and try and create a parameter on a profile called I'm the master with their ID in it. And so as soon as one person writes that in, they win. All the rest will fail because it modified and doesn't look like an empty parameter. Right? That's one example of what we use it. Another, so that's like a distributed lock, effectively. We use it effectively that way. And to make that case simpler, we added to the CLI the ability to atomically add and remove parameters from machines and profiles and plugins, so that's kind of a kind of, kind of good use for that one here. <laughs> um, the other example of where we use it is in the case of our Terraform provider. The Terraform provider works on a pooling concept where we have a set of machines that are put into a pool and then Terraform grabs them from the pool to keep from having a machine multiply allocated, we have a flag that we set to false, and then when Terraform allocates it, it sets it to true. And so the first thing we do whenever we allocate that machine is we test to make sure that value is false before we set it to true. And that way it guarantees that that instance of Terraform wins the race in allocating that machine. So that's a, that's a really important behavior aspect in creating a scalable pool of machines you don't. You can't have two clients accessing that pool at the same time. So right. blocks that. that that's a big deal. That, that's really helpful. I mean, this. You know, I, I wasn't even aware. I've been using the, the digital rebar provision for for months because I do a lot of the UX work. And in the UX, we've happily been putting objects instead of patching them. I hadn't even been aware that we were doing patch for a long time. This is one of those things where you, there's alternates to doing patch, but once you get patch sort of opens up this whole world of, of lockouts and making sure you haven't created race conditions. It's, it's really essential from a scale perspective. Um, and that was one of the things that sort of opened my eyes uh, and why I thought this is a good, good webcast, podcast, is that if you're doing restful calls and you're not using patch to do updates, then you're, and then you're really missing out on some important capabilities. And if, if your API doesn't support patch, then your API is going to have scaling challenges as you start getting more consumers against that API. Is that a fair, I'm saying that like a statement, is that, or is that a fair statement? I think that's true. It's also the case that adding patch, while there's a little overhead to start and making sure you get a good set of libraries available to do patch, once that's in place, it's actually not any more work maintaining and driving your objects than just normal puts are and creates. So it's one of those, there's a little upfront work to make sure you've got a good set of libraries to work with, and there, there are those out there. So it's not a burden to like create 
duplicate work. In fact, in this, the CLI, for example, our update, we don't really do puts anymore. There's a few cases where we do because the object is like, we'll put an ISO out, out there. You don't really patch an ISO. Or if you're putting a new object. Right, or if we, we post, without, without we post, post objects, right? So that's okay, but we, it's just been simpler to say, we're gonna do this one way, and the one way is the way that gives us the most feedback of things changing, modifying, and dealing with it, right? So then it just becomes a habit. It, even just on the surface, patching allows you to only change the fields that you wanna change, which in itself is a good thing. You're not sending a full object back because you're changing one field. Um, which which can reduce some wire traffic, but but I it, at this we're really not worried about wire traffic from that perspective or, or server overhead. So does patch allow us then the opportunity to, uh, like you just stated, you can change three parameters within a larger JSON blob, and as long as those three parameters haven't changed, we'll be successful in making that change, or is it effective to the entire blob of JSON? respectively, so something else could change in that JSON blob as long as it's not what we're touching? By default, whenever we, whenever uh, the patch library we use, um, whenever we generate a patch, we only generate test stances against things that we are changing. So if something else in an object changes that we aren't testing for, we deliberately will, you know, we're not going to fail in that case. So for the usual use cases, you know, we're updating a, we're updating a, a set of a couple of parameters on a profile to change them. You know, we don't necessarily want to, we don't want to fail if, uh, you know, some other parameter in that profile change that, you know, is outside of our scope. We just want to make sure that the ones that, the, the parameters that we want to make sure are valid changed, and that's what the test stances do by default. Um, we uh, had to add an extension to do whole object checks for a couple of things. Um, just to check to make sure that the um, that whenever we are updating an object that you know it's the whole thing is what we expect it to be before we make any changes and that's also pretty easy to do with patch. Yeah. So that so the ref when you pass a whole object will test the whole object. The, the, the default operation though is to test only partial objects. Nice. We were talking about generated code and objects and things like that. That brings me into one of our favorite uh, curse words slash benefits, which is Swagger. Um, so we built we built Swagger into the API from from Gen One. Uh, you want to talk about that as a history, and then, then Victor can take up on, on where we've been yeah. tearing things out. Yeah. Okay. So originally we chose and and decided we would make a Swagger based um, API, and so the endpoints for the JSON the JSON endpoints end up being Swagger annotated. And then we were using that to build both the JSON files so you can import it into things like Swagger UI or whatever tool you wanted to evaluate our API. Additionally, we said we would build our CLI from that JSON so that we could validate that the JSON was being generated correctly. And so we had been working for that. And in 341, we still generate the JSON, but we don't generate a CLI. And we'll let Victor rant for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so part of the reason for no longer generating the CLI from Swagger is that um, we have several different ways in which we can. Uh, the main thing was indexes. We have several different ways in which you can filter all of the objects that uh, return whenever you want to do a list of something. Uh, we provide a whole bunch of uh, filtering and sorting and uh, indexing capabilities on basically everything that we expose via the API. Um, however, Swagger is not flexible enough as a spec to allow us to expose the complete set of uh, filtering capabilities that we have for objects. Um, Part of that is that we have a lot of indexes and we have to manually you know, create little bits of Swagger for each one. And the other part of it is that we have on some of our objects the ability to dynamically index them based off of uh, parameters that are set on the object. Um, a, big, a big example of this is machines where 
you can filter where you can, uh, as, as part of a, a list, you can say, give me only machines that have this parameter set to this value. And uh, I could not find a way in Swagger either via annotations or via hacking the swagger.json directly, which you also really don't want to do, um, to express that we have that capability on the machine object or on all of our objects in general for that matter. And so that was the main thing that uh, led to the impetus of uh, getting rid of the uh, Swagger generated uh, client and CLI code and going with a natively written um, Go CLI and client um, where we can express that via Go's native uh, object composition yeah. models. So, so, how, so uh, for me, I'm, I'm an operator. So to me, that's all fabulous stuff. But what does that mean to me from, say, use of the CLI? The way we used to generate the CLIs is changed now, and based on this, and what benefit has that given to us? Well, so from an end user's perspective, hopefully if you're using the CLI, you won't see any difference at all, because we've maintained its use and form um, with, the with the transition. Um, so in that regard, you shouldn't see operational any change. But what you will see is yeah, that's good. That's good yeah. uh, what you will see is that it's much smaller. So one of the reasons, another reason that we weren't very fond of Swagger was it generated fairly bloated, redundant code, which is hard to maintain, hard to troubleshoot, and it was also hard to include in other other things. So for example, we have our Terraform provider that talks to our endpoint or DR, or DRPv3 endpoints. And so it had a custom client that we weren't exercising and we're maintaining separate from the CLI, which is kind of bad practice. The other part is that um, it was almost impossible, if not completely impossible to build that CLI into other things because it was post generated as part of our build process. So it's not actually in a go lang tree that you can say like go get the, the CLI or even the API component. So there was also some, as we've been expanding our scope to like be included into other tools like a Terraform provider or other things, um, it was kind of hard to say, oh, well, you now have to go get Swagger, you now have to generate the client, you now have to generate the API and include that into your binary too. Oh, by, by the way, here's another 16 megabits jump, right? And so, that was, that's another reason we kind of got rid of the whole Swagger generated client, because now if you want to include the API part of digital rebar provision, it's just a go get and versus previously you'd have to go get it, you'd have to do Swagger, you'd have to build Swagger, you'd have to all sorts of stuff. So we also have more exhaustive data testing on the new API simply because we do, we do basically full unit tests on the CLI, which and we have it set up so that whenever we do that, you know, that also catches everything that also catches everything in the API and all of the server side of the one. So when you're using the native CLI, you're using something that we've tested end to end, just as part of our regular development deploy process. So, so there are two points that I think are important to make on top of this for, for especially for our listeners not that familiar with digital rebound. First is We've been talking about removing Swagger from the client, the generated client-side code. The server still generates Swagger. If you're using a non-Go client, you can use Swagger client generation to exercise the digital rebar APIs and save yourself the trouble of writing a custom client. That, that's all, all still intact. In our case, we're doing Go on the server, Go on the client, it didn't make sense to create an impedance mismatch between the objects that the server uses and the client uses. And my second, this is my second point, because digital rebar in its, in its progression has actually been adding a lot of capabilities to the client to extend server functions. So a lot of the workflow pieces that we've been adding, a lot of the three, 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 four, um, sort of the, these uh, you know, locking behaviors and um, monitoring behaviors and management behaviors that are being written in the workflows from the client side are much more integrated into digital rebar server than we actually had originally thought they would be from a design pattern. So at, at this point, the, the, there is much less space between 
the server and the client for a lot of these post provisioning actions. And, and it's really become a more distributed application from that perspective. And, and, and having a translation to Swagger and a translation back from Swagger into the same language, um, it's like you using Google Voice to write your, your emails. Um, there's, there's definitely errors that creep into the process that are, are, are needed in that match. So, you know, we've, we've talked about patch, REST APIs, we've talked about Swagger, Swagger Client, which are all really key things, but they're all circling around this one other concept, which is integration. Um, and we've been building a couple of integrations into other, other systems. Uh, part of our design philosophy for Digital Rebar is not to make Digital Rebar this you know, total vertical stack that covers everything, but to really focus on the bottom and then and surgical knife. Surgical knife that solves a very specific problem and then integrates into other things. Shane, did you want to talk a little bit about some of the integrations we're working on and, and our philosophy there? Yeah, very much. Um, like I said, surgical knife, digital rebar provision is designed to get an operating system on your machines. I mean, at its bare, bare assess, at essentials. Um, part of any production operations environment and infrastructure contains an entire stack of stuff to operate infrastructure at scale. Uh, we are one of the lowest layer pieces. Uh, it's sort of the foundational piece that uh, all infrastructure is built on. Uh, when you get past the you know physical cooling data centers power etc uh, it's your operating system and your operating system configuration and environment that is the foundation of your application stacks that are running in an environment and uh, in an, a production environment there are a lot of places where you have tools that you need to operate to operate at scale and some of those things are things like asset management databases, IP address management, configuration management services, you have things like DNS, NTP servers. There's, there's a host of tools and, and pieces and parts out there. And as Rob uh, just mentioned, um, integration is, is critical because we need to be able to extend and embrace other people's tools. In our previous version of our, our product, uh, Digital Rebar version two, it was, it was an amazing product, but part of the problem was we tried to wrap our arms around everything we could and provide a, a great orchestration framework to deploy applications and get your stuff up and running. The problem is every operational environment has their own set of things and tools that they like. And operators are a grumpy bunch. They, uh, they, it, we, we were just talking about this in the office earlier, but they never like anything. They just hate things in different gradients. And you hope that you're at the bottom of the hate scale there. So. You know, operators are grumpy, and so what we want to do. <laughs> and if people listening to this, this is if we're self-describing here. If you think we're we're, we're, we're throwing shade at, at operators, this is the, this is a loving shade. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. So um, this is you know it's part of part of being an IT professional. Sometimes is is, is looking for ways to improve. You have to embrace the hate. Embrace, <laughs> embrace the, hate. the hate. Yes, and so so part of embracing that uh, environment uh, where. There are many different tools and components that do things. We need to be open and we need to be able to easily integrate. And to that end, um, uh, the workflow necessary to get an operating system and the configuration bits to some level to hand off other tools means something different to every other operator and every other shop. So we need to be flexible, easy to work with, and easy to integrate with. And all of the conversation about API stuff um, previously from the team is, is critical to that because open APIs make the difference in your ability to integrate. And that is one of the standout pieces with digital rebar provision, I think, is our ability to integrate. And some examples of that, um, during the workflow process of getting an operating system installed, there are a lot of things that, and decisions that you may need to make when you're operating scale. You might drop a thousand uh, new nodes into an infrastructure. Some of those nodes are going to become one role. Some of those nodes are going to become another role. And it's important to be able to allocate nodes or machines to given roles. And that can arbitrarily change. It may change based on a hardware SKU configuration. It may change on a, a rack location. 
It may change on you know a, a zone within a data center environment based on its uh, um, HA availability uh, metrics uh, and capabilities with fire suppression systems and power boundaries. There are a lot of different ways to define uh, how a role of a machine comes about, and that's complex. And again, it's custom to every shop. So, um, and, and also you need to be able to inventory that hardware. And so, one of the integrations we looked at was being able to provide as part of our discovery process when we first boot a machine, when it first becomes known to digital rebar, it may or may not become first known to an operator. Some cases, we are the first touch for a machine when the Pixie boot and the operating system process installation starts, and we need to inventory and discover that machine. And sometimes we need to integrate with an asset management or a configuration management service to be able to provide that physical machine information back to some other central infrastructure as code uh, component. And that, uh, in this case, we were looking at an integration with one of the configuration management database companies called Vice 42, and they operate on a fairly similar uh, com uh, principle of open APIs and capabilities. And they're like, hey, what you guys are doing is really cool. What we want to do is be able to have you guys first boot a machine, we, we discover it, we take your inventory, we feed it into our asset management database, and then an operator of a device 42 CMS or CMDB platform can now provide role information back to um, you to be able to do uh, operating system workflow implementation. And so open APIs, critical to that sort of capability. We have another uh, number of other integrations we're working on that we're really excited about. Um, Stackstorm is another very interesting one where they do uh, automation uh, orchestration general framework. Uh, they have some really interesting tools and we're starting a, an engagement to integrate with them so DRP can be driven through events that are triggered in the infrastructure to do lifecycle management, provisioning, reprovisioning, or dynamic scaling of clusters, or even uh, scaling down clusters. A lot of European customers, power is very expensive. They want to scale clusters down and compact workloads you know, during uh, high power uh, cost times, and we can provide that ability by being able to be an integrated tool into that component and that, that chain. Is that sort of that's no, those are exactly the type of things that it's important to realize, right? It's we're not building APIs and CLI capabilities in the abstract. They're all driven based on real needs um, that we've been talking about today, right? Everything from distributed lock for provisioning a Kubernetes cluster automatically, or being able to make sure that we get resources from a pool, to being able to integrate with another system where we can handle events or buy events out of the system. So. Um, you know, APIs are, you know, there's no surprise to anybody nowadays, APIs are really important. Um, what, what I was hoping for this podcast, and I think we've accomplished, is to give people a real insight into the type of thinking that RackN puts into those APIs in ways that they can, they can sort of take that thinking and use it as lessons learned into other projects. So, thank you all. This was really good and helpful. So thanks, Rob. I would, I would like to add to our listeners, if you're interested to learn more about Digital Rebar or get started, um, you can go to rebar.digital. Um, there is a Slack community channel. There's, um, you can just jump right in and download and get the code. The install guides and everything are there. Um, the other thing, Shane, if you can just let them know, I think the online meetups are really useful. So can we go ahead and let, me, let people know where to go to get that information? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, every other week we run a digital rebar online meetup that's focused pretty heavily around the open source implementation of digital rebar. And that meetup is hosted and, and managed through meetup.com. If you go to meetup.com slash digital rebar, you'll find us there. We'd love to have you join our community and participate. Uh, the more participation from our community members uh, that we get, the better we uh, product that we make. We've already seen a lot of really great feedback from our uh, open source community and in terms of providing both use cases, real world examples, and um, uh, help in, in defining uh, project role and scope, uh, some of our product features that has been really great feedback. So please join the community and join us every other week. We run uh, Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, we try to be as open to as many times as as possible can't cover the whole growth globe at one time we do record the podcast so you can catch up with us later on when you have a chance 
Well, great, Shane. Thanks again. And uh, everyone, thanks for uh, joining on the podcast. And uh, we look forward to having you uh, participate in Digital Rebar in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen.